So thank you. Okay, can you see it? All good. Thank you again. So today I will talk about the relation between the capability approach and UBI, uh, in particular the the capability to work. So uh, what is the capability approach? Okay. According to the capability approach, capabilities constitute the most reachable magic or theory of justice, insofar as the capabilities uh, directly reflect what people are able to do and to be. Uh, but what are the capabilities? Capabilities are defined as the real opportunities to achieve certain functionings. Whereas functionings are understood as all states and activities, beings and doings, that each person may might face throughout a lifetime. For example, being well nourished is a function, is a, a, a state, and the real opportunity to be well nourished is the corresponding capability. Um, however, there there is a gap that has has been identified in respect of the various capability based theories of justice, since such theories are solely recipient oriented. That is, they are centered on the benefits, capabilities that people are entitled to enjoy, but they are silent about the obligations, the burdens which legitimize people's entitlement to these benefits. At first uh, sight, uh, the, the, does not seem to be unavoidable. Uh, society can commit itself to distributing them. In return for enjoying them, members uh, commit themselves to contributing, to create them, create this benefit. In this case, people will be entitled to have the capabilities for a good life, so long as they exercise the capability to work. And in fact, it is basically what is uh, uh, advocated by Elizabeth Anderson. Uh, uh, a great uh, theorist of uh, capa capabilitarian theory. Yet, uh, in my opinion, uh, this way which seems to challenge the suitability of the capabilities as a magic of justice, uh, because uh, this challenge might arise from the relationship between what the notion of capability by definition implies, that is what being able to do and to be implied, and the kind of access to the means, the external conditions that give rise to capabilities concern, which this notion requires. Okay, let me let me explain. A capability is a, the real opportunity to, to achieve a certain function. Real, in this context, should be understood as being able to. So, in a literal sense, capability in, is an absolute notion, what I call the strong interpretation of capability. Uh, according to Ingrid Robbins, Either we have an option that is a functioning with 100 probability of being achieved if you choose it, or if the probability is lower, it is implied that we do not have the capability at all. Under this interpretation, the, but under this interpretation, the the distribution of capabilities would seem to demanding. So maybe you you should adopt another interpretation what I call the weak interpretation. And by the weak interpretation, capability rather than absolute notion are more uh, um, are a, a gradual notion. Well, uh, according to Robbins, capabilities can be more or less robust. Uh, and by robustness is meant the probability of success in achieving the correspond corresponding uh, function. Also, it has been chosen. The more robust, the more probable. So, the more robust people's capability are, the better they reflect what people are able to do and to be. However, even under the weak interpretation, if the access to the benefits which confer a sense of on the capabilities for a minimally good life is conditional, that is subject to the counterpart of working then people may fail to obtain this access if they turn out to be unsuccessful in the performing 
of the actions that we require of them. So the robustness of these capabilities will be threatened with the risk that if the reverse, robustness were too low, they would reflect a very full picture of what people are uh, able to do and to be. Uh, uh, a possible uh, solution um, uh, to this problem is to accept, accept that people's entitlement to the capabilities for their lives should be subject to the obligation to work, but provided that capability to work is sufficiently robust as well. That's, that is, insofar as the capabilities for a good life are reliant on the capability to work, the robustness of the, the former will be proportional to the robustness of the latter. Therefore, it is only necessary to ensure the robustness of the capability to work to ensure the robustness of overall capability set. And an effective way to, to do that is on our end by promoting people unconditional access as, as much as possible to a work position. And on the other hand, guaranteeing that these work positions are at least in accordance with the minimum threshold of decency. That is, on the burden side, the work was incombent in, in, in the combination of his uh, error capacities and the, the character of the task the man offer as a high probability of, of success in performance and in the performing, it is not forced to undermine or pose a, a risk to any cap capability of the set, which would place her below the threshold of the minimum good life. I know this, <laughs> this is a quite difficult, uh, but how to do that? How to distribute capability to work? What kinds of policies are most effective for distributing the capability to work accordingly? I, analyze three uh, options. The first one would be the work, work fair policies without uh, modifying the, the existing labor market. But uh, there is a problem. This option may, may be effective in ensuring that, that everyone has access to a job, but it cannot, cannot guarantee that this work meets the desired level of decency. Uh, so, um, so maybe we could opt for for uh, the, the second option would that would be work guarantee policies attached to a decent threshold uh, in a weaker version uh, this would be uh, um, this result this would result in the regulation of the labor market with a set of legal reform such as uh, uh, fixing a minimum wage, uh, limiting working hours, etc. And in a stronger version uh, would be add to these reforms the direct creation by society through the state of the workforce for everyone shaped to this ideal of decency. So, what would be the hypothesis of the state as employer of last week? The, despite the eventual merits of some of these measures, their potential is limited, in my opinion, by the, the difficulty of defining in neutral and no arbitrary way what is meant by a minimum threshold of decency. In other words, or how to specify the capability to work. So, by means of these policies, the society runs the risk of, of imposing on everyone a perfectionist conception of decent work. This obstacle would be if there were a democratic consensus within society about, about what is meant by a minimum threshold of this. Although such, such consensus seems to be difficult to be reached. But even if society can make a consensus possible, the capability to work still could not be fully, fully specified solely at macro level. Although a portion of the terms of cooperation may be defined at macro level, like limitation of working hours, minimum wage, health and safety rules, etc., other will only be decided at the micro level. That is within each workplace by its respective direct stakeholders, workers and employer, employers. 
this is due to the combination of following three conditions. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there, uh, there is first. There is no criterion for assessing what decent work is apart from what each person thinks what the decent work is. What I call the liberal condition. Second, beyond general aspect, each workplace has its own particular features, such routines and socialization patterns that only those who the, those who personally experience them can truly know what I call epistemological condition. And finally, many of these important, uh, many of these particular aspects are not system, are not uh, liable to being fixed, but rather have to be negotiation, negotiated on a day by day basis and moment by moment basis between the parts involved, what we call dynamic condition. And this leads to the conclusion that not all the terms are amenable to being fixed by ex ante decision maker, uh, this decision making, uh, uh, bit, uh, bit, um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 but negotiate uh, 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 moment by moment. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't a lot. A lot. Um, of course, it also, uh, it's possible ex sense, ex -sense at micro level to set some boundaries that, that impose limits, at least partially on the patterns of negotiation and eventually mitigate to bargaining power assumed. By say, setting a new wage, an employer is not allowed to negotiate with a worker for less than a month. However, there remain some points on which is not feasible to, to set boundaries. For instance, to fix uh, uh, it's, it, to fix the maximum n number of hamburg hamburgers that a worker at uh, on restaurant can grill in an hour, um, over which it is to comply with a minimum ideal of decency. The same applies to trying to set the, uh, a limit on the level of decibels the boss is allowed to use to communicate with his subordinate, or on the frequency in which he can interrupt his uh, subordinate's activities to check that, that everything is going uh, well, etc. Only those who live such experience firsthand would seem to be qualifi uh, qualified to assess them. Thus, uh, although such work and these policies may be effective in ensuring that everyone has access to a job, by virtue of the combination of these three conditions, they still fall short of guaranteeing that the work meets a minimum threshold of decency, defining the neutral and non arbitrary way. Um, that leads to uh, the the first uh, the third uh, option, the uh, work guarantee policies combined with a, 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 a unconditional basic income. And so far as the minimum threshold of decency is dependent on ongoing bargaining power of those involved to negotiate, it may to make sense in that sense of a perfect a perfect equilibrium to set on a minimum threshold of bargaining power for all. Uh, in other words, um, uh, it makes sense in a sense of productive labor to settle on a minimum threshold of bar bargaining power for all. In other words, the aim is enable everyone to have the minimum, minimum re reasonable power to say no. And uh, uh, a mechanism, a good mechanism to guarantee that everyone uh, have a minimum reasonable power to say no, it's, uh, it's the UBI. Let us imagine that everyone received the UBI. Let us suppose that the amount may not be enough to ensure that all, uh, ensure all the capabilities for a good life, but it, it will at least cover the, uh, those required for subsistence. For example, you will nourish, healthy, warmed out, etc. Since these are already assured by the UBI, People concerned with have great power to negotiate the terms of cooperation in their own interests. That is, they know uh, now have an acceptable alternative to say no to the terms of co uh, of cooperation. 
as might be proposed to them by their employer or, employer or superior. Uh, but in conclusion, there, there seems to be good reasons to implement an, uh, a UBI, per, perhaps combined with other work currency measures to distribute capability to work, associated with a minimum threshold of efficiency, defined in, a, in, a, in no arbitrary way. In this way, people assure themselves that whatever not happened, their capabilities will never fall short of a certain level of robustness. Either, either they succeed through the negotiation process in getting the terms of cooperation presented to them to be in line with what each one considers to be at least minimal decent, or if their negotiation goals are not achieved, they know that they can reject the final offer while taking for granted a subset of capabilities associated with at least a subsistence threat threshold. So the UBI serves as a protection against the possible lack of robustness of capability of work. Thank you. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> Sometimes. That's no problem. Thank you very much, Hugo. Um, I'm going to pass over to um, Joanna, who's going to talk about how UBI can sh shift power the shift to a restorative era for ourselves and for the planet. Uh, but we're going to swap who's sharing screens first. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to be here. I as um as we're getting ready and. I'm pulling up my presentation here. I would like to say, um, you know, that I come from the corporate world, um, but um, my interest in employee engagement really stems from an interest in human behavior and emotions at work. And um, when I read the mission of the Congress to bring basic income from idea to reality, I felt really inspired to bring an idea uh, that has come to me after a deeply personal experience. Um, it was a traumatic experience in the workplace that led to a mental health leave and then followed by a self-funded sabbatical. I like to consider the year that I took off um, kind of a self-awarded fellowship that I gave to myself. And during that year, I did work um, on what I call an employee engagement model, but really it's a new model for work um, and it was kind of the combination of my dreams and my vision for the future, not only for myself, but for the employees that I've worked with over my career, the tens of thousands of employee survey comments that I've read from employees talking about what they wished work was like, what they dreamed work was like. Um, and so what I come to you today with is very humble offering. It's, um, it's my vision, it's my dream, and I'm so excited to share it with you. And so I really would love to hear any questions, any, um, anything that's not clear that, that you wanna ask me about. But before I start, um, I want to actually begin a presentation with a statement um, that I wrote during this deeply personal time um, that led to a lot of this, this work. Is everybody able to see my screen? I'm not sure if I'm sharing nope. yet. Okay. Not yet. Let me pop back out. And of course, this is, here we go. Okay. There we are. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> so, so the statement that I want to read um, that began this, this deeply personal work um, goes like this. I am not a resource. I am not a resource to be optimized for the purpose of making money. The truth is that there are so many organizations that exist solely for the purpose of optimizing humans to make money. They may dress it up with a purpose-driven mission statement, but for those that do exist just for profit, your employees can feel it and they will suffer as a result. But not only your employees will suffer, their families, their children, their physical health, their relationships with people in their community, how they drive on the road, how much sleep they get at night, whether they have time to eat, to take a break, or to get up and walk around, or even go to the bathroom. All of this influences your employees, your customers, your product, and as a result, families, communities, the planet, everything suffers. Everything is worse as a result. 
According to Gallup in the United States, only one in 10 employees are engaged at work. And when I see that number, I have to ask myself, doesn't that mean that nine in 10 are suffering? Does it mean that nine in 10 can feel that they're being used as resources? I believe it's time to usher in a new era of work, one where we put people first and profit is no longer an accepted measure of success. The era of optimizing humans for profit has to end. And I'm not talking about just remote first working. I'm talking about way more than that. So I ask the question, um, and this is something that, I, as, I, as again, I said in the beginning, I come from the corporate world um, where profit is the objective and employee engagement is an industry that is a $73 billion um, that companies leverage to extract more productivity from their humans. Um, and I asked the question in the year 2021 on planet Earth, shouldn't we be farther along than this, than optimizing humans in the planet for profit? <clears throat> and again, if only one in 10 employees are engaged, I do believe that that means that nine in 10 are suffering in some ways. Um, the era of work that we were in, that we are in right now, I, I really do consider an, ex, an exploitative era of work, um, exactly for that reason, because we extract productivity from people and the planet. And the model is not working. My experience um, working at American Express, US Airways, Emirates, Southwest Airlines, most recently an airline in Spain, has taught me that the model in place, the way we work today, keeps people unhappy. Um, and I believe I have firsthand experience and knowledge, um, not only from my personal experience, but from 15 years to be able to say this um, broadly. Um, and what I view is that the solutions are not coming fast enough from current institutions, not only government um, who does not offer a UBI, um, but our institutions, our private institutions, our corporations where people work and where so much of what I believe is um, trauma is perpetuated in the capitalistic and um, you know, economy that optimizes humans and the planet. But I do believe that right now we are at this place in the labor landscape where employees have never had a stronger voice. Um, I, I have seen many companies kind of cave to some of the demands from employees that have come about as COVID, particularly the move to remote working. Um, and I do believe that that has become, that those decisions have been made in response to pressure from um, the labor market. And what I've seen for as long as I've been in this industry is that there's a severe supply and demand problem when it comes to, there is a huge demand from employees who want to work for companies that enable them to live better lives. Um, but there is a severe market shortage of companies that provide that kind of, of opportunity for people, potentially with the exception of a company like Patagonia, which is considered a teal organization in terms of organizational development. Um, Patagonia does things like they hire people who are passionate about saving planet Earth, and then if they're ever arrested um, because they're protesting for environmental legislation, climate change, Patagonia will pay the employees legal fees and bail them out of jail because they believe so strongly that that commitment to a mission to protect the planet, um, that they don't want their people to stop pursuing those passions, even if it means getting in trouble with law. I find that to be um, a pretty radical but beautiful example of a place where you really can work um, with all of yourself and are supported in, in return. It's a very rare exception, I think, in, in work. Um, but what I really believe that we're seeing with this severe supply and demand problem that's been going on for decades, um, but that has been made all the more obvious with COVID and kind of the rise of employee, the employee voice, I really do believe that the era of profiting from people and planet has ended um, in terms of people's desire to be um, 
dedicating their lives to work for profit for profit companies. Um, I do believe that the the system, the new, new model, the sector that takes the place um, and solves the need for employees is what's missing. And so what I want to do is take you through an imagined um, vision for the future. And I, I really do um, ask you to kind of just open your mind and heart to this idea of what, what work could be in the future and what I personally experienced in my self-made bubble um, in the year that I was off. Um, and so, yeah, I'd like to take you through this. Um, this is a vision for the future of work. And this vision is one where work, quote unquote, which I will use for whatever it is that lights us on fire in our lives, whatever it is that we believe we should be doing with our lives. Um, but this vision is one where work might actually mean having the permission and tools to do three things, do the inner work and heal our heart places. And I'll get into this in a bit. Um, second, reconnect with the earth and sky that accompanies us through our lives and of which we are a part. And this really is just reconnecting with the planet, with, with nature. Um, and three, sharing our unique gifts with the world in a way that sets us aflame. So what I want to take you through this, this, that, that first description was a bit of kind of the, you know, just the dream, but what I have here to take you through is um, a framework for employee engagement that competes with the engagement um, frameworks of Deloitte, of Gallup, of human synergistics. This is a framework that I developed. It's my work. Um, this is all my artwork throughout the presentation as well. This, this is just a manifestation of kind of my dream for the future, but the why um, is a five pillar framework that Un, that explains why I believe this way of working is possible. That's what I'm gonna get into first and then I'll come back into the how, which will go into that doing the inner work, reconnecting with the earth and sharing your gifts. Um, so this is the restorative model is what I call it. Um, there are a lot of models out there and, and it, ironically, this actually kind of connects to um, the five outcomes of UBI in a weird way, but they're the research that shows what we need at work and um, what creates a positive work environment um, have so much to do with systems of power and um, other things that exist in organizations to measure, monitor, and control what people do. And my experience in employee engagement has taught me that when you remove all of that and you are free to find your own purpose within the construct of a supportive community, um, that is actually when you do your best work and when you can discover what it is that you're meant to do instead of what you can get paid for. So the first piece, um, there are five and I'll go through them quickly, is that there is shared belief and that you are stoked about the work that you are doing. Um, and this is, you know, is stated here in a we statement, we want to belong to a community that shares a common belief and is excited to do the work. This is kind of one of the first principles of what we need at work. The second, um, well, this is a little teaser as well. So um, in this case, the shared belief in this imagined world is we all believe that UBI is a basic human right and that it can power a new way of working and ultimately power and fund UBI for all humans on the planet. Very aspirational, crazy um, vision, but psychological safety and authenticity, which is the second piece of what we need. And that would be that we're all safe to be all that we are without judgment or fear as we do our work. Um, here we have freedom and authenticity, which is that we have the total freedom to work or not. And this is where um, potentially the combination of work and UBI it might throw people off because there is universality and um, unconditionality in this and the idea that this is a model for the future of work, but there are no bosses. There is nobody controlling you. This is more of a community of like-minded individuals who are interested in pursuing work in this new model. Um, and so that's why it's important here that I state throughout that you have the total freedom to work or not when, where, why, and in the way we feel we do our best work. Next, with partnership and guidance, a lot of um, models out there say that in order to have a positive experience at work, you need a strong leader. You need strong leadership and performance appraisals and somebody telling you what your weaknesses and 
strengths are and telling you when you're ready to be promoted. And I actually think all of that's um, bullshit and not necessary. And I think that limits people's ability to do their best work. So this um, pillar of the strategy partnership and guidance instead suggests that if you belong to a community of people that truly believe in you and are there to help you and walk with you on a journey to find your unique talent, there is no need for the systems of power and structure and that those things actually um, inhibit people's work. The last um, of the five kind of needs at work is that we all have the freedom, support, and resources to share our unique gift with the world in whatever way lights us aflame to be alive. Um, so when I look at this model, there are comparative models that I could stand up next to it that are used by Google and Facebook and Southwest Airlines that say, these are the things that you need to have a positive work environment and do productive work. But that is from a profit mindset. Um, and this model, I think, in, in my vision, this is a, a model that combines UBI and work. This is a model that gives people um, a ridiculously robust UBI, way more than what I've heard people talking about at this Congress, which I think um, indicates my, my ignorance on the topic. Um, but my dream is to combine the kind of Dan Price um, gravity payments, 70,000 United States dollars per year as the top um, earning amount before really earning any further doesn't make any, any material difference in your life. There are studies that have been used and that have supported a lot of organizations going to a $70,000 per year minimum wage. Um, there are a handful of companies out there beyond gravity payments that I know of that are doing it. And um, what the research has shown about that $70,000 figure is that earning beyond that really doesn't improve much of your, your ability to thrive in life. Um, and so I have this dream that there's enough money printed maybe in the world for everyone to receive $70,000 USD and belong to a community that works in this way, that quote unquote works in this way. Um, and I'll keep going because I think when I finish this, it will become perhaps more clear the whole picture. The how, what I want to get into next. So what I spoke to you about was the why. It's kind of why would you work in that five pillar model? Um, those, are, those are the pieces of research that, that support that. The how is really uncommon and it feels weird, um, but I think it might just feel weird because it's not how we do things today. So how you might work in this new model is to focus on Three things. The first is to do the inner work. Um, and this is something that came as a result of my personal journey. Um, Bo Xiao, who is the founder of Evolve Foundation and Evolve Ventures, they're a venture capitalist. They're, they fund um, technology that gives people the permission and tools to heal uh, from suffering. And they invest in, in companies that seek to alleviate human suffering. And he has a beautiful story that I've linked in the slide here. But what he talks about in his story is that we're often taught in our society that working on yourself is selfish and that it's much better to toil, to work for the profit of others, for the, for the betterment of others. But what Bo taught me in his story is that in fact, the most selfless thing you can do in the world is figure out who you are and what your unique, beautiful talent is, what your unique gift to the world is, and figure out a way to give that gift and share that gift. And so this idea of UBI plus work for me is kind of smashing together the idea of a company plus UBI. And, um, and so this idea of the people who might join this organization, uh, they're not employees, I would call them founders, and, and their time is 100% their own. They receive UBI, which is this ridiculous $70,000 amount. Um, there are no job descriptions, no performance appraisals, no schedule, no requesting time off. Each person defines how, when, where, and if they contribute to the mission. But the mission of this organization is to power and fund UBI for every planet, every human on planet Earth. Um, Reconnect with earth and sky, which is the second kind of thing that you do as a part of your work, which is really important to slowing down and 
And I think really listening and restoring our connection with the environment um, for me has been deeply healing and, and has been an opportunity for me to really examine the role that living in a capitalist society has played just in my life and in, in the dreams that I have allowed myself to have. Um, and, and disconnecting from the corporate world the way that I did and having the freedom um, really gave me the opportunity to, to connect with the planet in a way that also um, powered some of the thinking behind this model and inspired really the, the connection to, to the planet. The third piece of this is I really truly believe that each, each one of us has something unique to offer the world. Um, and I also believe it's impossible for a for-profit company to define that purpose for you. I think it's really difficult to find your purpose living in a world where the options that are given to you are to find a way to optimize who you are in order for um, make a profit. So the next piece of this um, is the restorative question set, which um, in my industry, in the employee engagement world, the way that we measure employee happiness and employee engagement at work is 100% tied to commercial metrics. So they're tied to things like profitability, return on investment, um, productivity for things like an airline on-time performance, right? Um, all of the measures that are tied back to things that happen to an employee at work are tied to profit. And so I have come up with a set of questions that reject, uh, I mean, fully within this model and this idea for the future, I reject profit as, as a measure of success. And um, there are 14 items that I would like to read to you. And then this is the end of, of my presentation. But before I read these questions to you, I really want to ask you to take a moment and think. Um, these 14 items measure some of the most basic human experiences, things that we often put aside for our careers and things that 100% are not asked by corporations of their employees. Um, things that are asked on this survey are things that we often numb, things that we don't have time for, things that get in the way of work. But the question I ask you is if you could answer strongly agree to all 14 questions on this list, what kind of contribution could you be making to the world with your unique talents? And this is the, the restorative question set. These questions measure the kind of life people are living as a result of work. And they all begin with since coming to work here. And that's just used for this, for this purpose. So since coming to work here, I sleep better at night. Since coming to work here, I have more time to shop for and prepare healthy meals. I have more time to relax. I have more time just for me. I have more time to enjoy nature. I've connected more with earth and sky. I have more time to enjoy the things that make me happy. I'm understanding more of what makes me special. I'm getting closer to finding my unique talent. I'm learning to love myself. I'm learning more about what I need to feel comfortable and safe. I'm becoming more loving toward others. My relationships with loved ones have improved and making a positive contribution in my community. These questions to me feel like a much more powerful way to measure how well the work environment is, how, how well people can thrive while doing work that is important to them. And so this concept kind of scrambles the brain because what I'm, what I'm proposing is a, a for-profit company um, profiting UBI. Essentially, it's, it's harnessing the power of a capitalist for-profit machine um, and powering that machine with the talents of people, but that profit that is generated through human innovation and, and solutions to eliminate human suffering is what funds UBI. I sometimes feel like I have, I have a hard time 
articulating this um, because it's such a combination of two worlds. But this is the final thing, the final, final thing I'm going to leave you with. Um, and this is written here so that anybody can read it. Um, but in 1997, Jeff Bezos, um, in his letter to shareholders, he wrote 1,597 words, most of which were dedicated to profit. And this is, I, I bring this up as an illustration of what uh, the capacity for innovation that we have when it comes to generating profit and the willingness to pour millions and billions of dollars to fund um, this kind of an endeavor. When there was an important warning in the letter that Jeff Bezos wrote to shareholders, and um, there were five words or terms dedicated to employees in his letter, and they're hardworking, high bar, not easy, not meant to be easy, and sacrifice. And I, I share this letter almost from a perspective of pain to say that this is a celebrated artifact in the business world. And um, this idea of a willingness to put a, you know, to, to take short-term losses in favor of long-term profit. Um, but what I wonder if, you know, if anybody who read that letter worried about the sentiments expressed in the Our Employees section, or if they saw it as a warning. And now Amazon, a company that employs more than 200,000 employees in the world. And I would venture to say the majority of those people are harmed in their work um, with that company. I, I, I kind of pose back, um, what would an open letter to the world look like about a company that gave a salary level UBI with universality and unconditionality, but uh, invited people um, to slow down, look inward, focus at themselves, um, figure out who they are if they haven't, um, heal the things that the world has, has harmed, um, and then we're supported in a community of like-minded individuals who supported each other's work because they were passionate about it, not because they were required to. Um, this kind of a company, from what I know of um, this demand, supply and demand problem um, and the deep, deep yearning, I feel like on behalf of humans to work in environments that allow them to thrive and live lives that are full of joy, um, where they can fulfill their, their own potential. I believe if this company were launched uh, that you wouldn't be able to stop pouring in of, of applications and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a apply you're, you know, given a job. It's everybody's accepted. It's, it's a wild idea and I'll stop there, but um, that's my dream. And I'm so excited that I had some time to share with you guys. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, in the interest of keeping some time for discussion, I'm going to go straight into Hannah's presentation. Great. Um, Martha, I see you just raised your hand. You can either stick uh, some questions in the Q&A in the Hoover. Um, Hannah, feel free to I'll stop that. Um, feel free to stick it in the Q&A um, or uh, we can get to it after Hannah's presentation. But I will get to you um, just after we've heard our third speaker. I'll hand it over to Hannah now. So you, I guess you can see my presentation. Uh, go into presentation mode. Uh, I cannot see it. Um. <laughs> if you click the button at the in the top left corner there that says um, from the beginning with the play, that should do it. No, I just have a problem. Yeah, it just doesn't look as it did before. Um, let's see. Yeah. 
There we go. Got it there. Okay. So, great. <laughs> so I'd like to share now some of my work with you on decoupling income from labor. Um, so this is uh, based on um, my field research amongst communards, rentiers, and pensioners. While it is commonly assumed that basic income decouples income from work, it is less clear what exactly would happen to labor. How would people actually make use of basic income? Would they really live differently with it? The answers we get from existing experimental research on basic income is one, people continue to do paid work if they are given a basic income, and second, they report they feel less stressed. There are many arguments that you may bring forward against experimental research, um, depending on what you're interested in basic income. So the, the value of, of, of experimental research is, is rather limited. The question that I focus on and experiments um, do not really give an answer to is, why is it that people continue to be firmly oriented towards paid work, and how could it be otherwise? This is the key question that I use as a starting point to think around um, the conditions under which basic income would really bring about what Van Parijs has called real freedom, or also um, uh, my, my, my colleague here has already uh, mentioned this with regards to uh, capabilities. With the multi-sided ethnography and decoupling that I've carried out, I propose an alternative methodology to study basic income by looking at situations of guaranteed livelihoods that are similar to basic income and already exist within this society. This is an approach that is, let me see, I want to go to the next slide. Huh. That's never happened. Um, yeah, I cannot change my slides. Uh oh, not helpful. Um, is the bottom left? Okay, uh, I found I found some way. Um, let's add the yeah weird. Okay, um, so this is an approach that is not so much interested in the question of what people would do uh, of what people would do with the basic income than what basic income would do to the people. It's based on the idea that these situations um, that I'm looking at prefigure what we would see in the transitioning phase from capitalist work society to a basic income society. So what I do is I look at people's practices, that is their paid and unpaid work activities, their uses and interpretations of money and how people perceive themselves, how they see themselves. And um, so I look at practices as moldable, Practices are the product of the interplay of interior or internalized embodied structures inside people um, that the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu may call the habitus or dispositions um, and um, the ex exterior structures of a given society. So the specific labor market structures and case, the way families function and, or education and practices are the product of this interplay of interior and exterior structures. Um, drawing on feminist theory, um, and as I already mentioned, the habitus concept of Pierre Bourdieu, gift and money theories, I'm particularly interested in how people's embodied beliefs about their labor and themselves bear on what they do in situations where they do not have to take care of their own income. If you would like to know more about this approach, this theoretical approach, then you can check out um, the sociological review. It's um, a journal and it's um, there's going to be an article um, published open access um, and the, the the first part of the title is living differently question mark and the argument i try to make in this talk is that decoupling income from labor is relational to actors individual habitus and the social relations they are embedded in in the following i can only give you glimpses of my findings that are based on an ethnography that comprises 25 in-depth interviews, informal conversations, a six weeks participant observation, a short questionnaire survey and secondary data. I have analyzed the data following the grounded theory methodology and using habitus hermeneutics for the data analysis. 
I've now uh, picked some perspectives to illustrate my argument, and you will find volunteering activities or generally unpaid activities crossing through the individual perspectives, um, sort of as a common thread um, through the uh, interviews that I'm going to present. Please also note that I changed names, um, uh, professions, and organizations to preserve the anonymity um, of the person and case. I will start with the commune. This is a community um, grown out of the 68 generation. It is a relatively large structure with 80 members. Um, it was founded around values of social ecological sustainability. In its uh, founding document, you can read this sentence here. Um, this is the communist principle, which runs from each according to his ability to each according to her needs. Um, I want to give you an idea of how community life actually looks like through the perspective of Susanna. Susanna is a 52 year old woman who entered the commune in her, day, in her early 30s. She wanted to become part of a community where she would also be able to bring him her skills as a professional craftsperson. The community offers many different work areas from the community based kitchen to a kindergarten to a community based agriculture. Most of the people I encounter inside the commune work flexibly or part time, but they always claim they are busy. And at the same time, they are never being seen on the numerous beautiful benches inside the garden. Susanna has always been working in the craft shop and contributed her income thus generated to the community's shared wallet. The community follows a shared economy model that is all private wealth, income from paid work and other sources is being socialized. However, for a couple of years now, Susanna is no longer able to work as a work woman because she suffers from multiple diseases. Although she does still contribute money, through her state and validity pension, she suffers from not contributing income through her own gainful work. So do many others, particularly men who bring in little or no income, who are justifying themselves to me. Importantly, when it comes to taking out money from the shared wallet, no one simply takes out money according to her needs. Almost everyone calculates or strives to taking, for taking out money in proportion to what one has given in. Susanna is not inactive though. She's taking care of her godchild, the child of another communist. She helps migrants study German and she still does her share in communal work. That is, she's doing the dishes. All these activities, however, seem to be hardly valued by herself. Rather, she refers to herself as a deficient member of the dishwashing team, emphasizing that she's unable to keep up with the pace of the rest of the team, although uh, she actually works um, un un under. Um, uh, and the pain. When we talk, Susanna has just come back from a Vipassana semin seminar, a seminar in Buddhist meditation. Participation in the seminar was free of charge. It completely relied on the voluntary contributions of participants, both in terms of money and labor. Greatly inspired by this experience, Susanna now longs for, for creating new structures inside the commune. Structures where it would be possible to give in a truly decoupled and free way, where there would be no longer a sense of obligating reciprocity. That more or less worthy is the experience of all the communists that I talk to. A sense of obligation is also what characterizes many of the experience of those of my interviews who I call rentiers. The term rentier comes from rent and refers to an income or re Remuneration, I quote Thomas Piketty, generated from the ownership um, of an asset that is independent from own labor. I've conducted 10 interviews with volunteers, eight of them being receivers of a family in inheritance. The remaining two may be called self made volunteers because they live off dividend dividends of their own company. The source of the rent may be property in real estate, it may be a financial asset or land. I will start by pointing out the experience of Miss Court, a heiress who calls herself the voluntary founder's daughter. Miss Court is 55 years at the time of the interview. For 12 years, she has been making ends meet through her father's inheritance in the form of housing rent. She's also a volunteer head of organization. When her father had this plan, it appears she was not able to reject it. 
he had asked her to administer part of his wealth as head of an organization that funds civil society projects. Ms. Kurt, who had previously been employed as a teacher, took over great strategic responsibility and at times worked full time in the organization. Yet she always fears this is not work anyway. She says she has fallen out of the we, and she feels the pressure that she should be more grateful and fully exploit this total freedom given to her. As she makes clear to me in the interview, she wants to talk to me about recognition and how money can contribute to it. Ms. Court generally feels she has to justify herself, as do many of the others, other volunteers I talk to. A, a different point of view is that by Mr. Lucas, a 61-year-old man living off the dividends of his company. He is what I call a self-made volunteer who uses his wealth to retire early from paid work. He comments on his decision. I've worked so much in my life, that'll do. Life consists of other facets too. Having worked very long hours and having had great strategic responsibility throughout his professional life, Mr. Lucas dreams of a life dedicated to his personal interests and hobbies, traveling, sports, mountaineering, a life in the absence of any duties. However, a retreat into the private sphere cleaned off any caring responsibilities appears far away. Cases of illness and death inside his family had coincided with his retirement. Retirement as an early retirement is one way for Mr. Lucas next to his lifelong labor that he does not uh, miss to stress um, how Mr. Lucas legitimizes his retreat from the labor market. The institution of retirement, albeit relatively young in Germany, it was founded in 1957, um, is a, uh, an institution that enjoys particular popularity in Germany, but also in other European countries. The well-merited retreat in German, their Wohlverdiente Ruhestand. The word Ruhestand contains the English uh, rest. So it refers to a state of resting, um, whose premise, however, is the intergenerational pension contract that, again, uh, relies on each person's wage labor contributions. Public legitimacy is also what underlies the experience of the pensioner, Ms. Charles. Due to a family inheritance, Ms. Charles retires early from her demanding position as school director. Asked by her net networks, she has taken up several intense volunteering commitments that allow her to make use of her professional skills and expertise. Other pensioners will pursue other activities depending on their network skills and inclinations built up over their life courses. Mrs. Charles, for her part, as time and money to volunteer, she complains not to have leisure, but overall she seems to be satisfied. She does not need to justify herself or anything she does. So, ah, now well. What about decoupling? A majority of my interviews justify themselves when they are not doing paid work. Self justifications are symptoms of a crisis of the habitus which intimately ties four elements together, the self, the worth, money, and labor. Habitus crisis, however, is not inevitable. As we can see, there is no such crisis in the cases of pensioners and self-made rentiers who seem to occupy legitimized positions. The activities that actors pursue are a function not only of their capacities, their habitus, but also they depend on the social relations actors are embedded in. Inside the commune, for example, there is work, reproductive communal work that simply cannot not be done. This kind of work has precedence over private hobbies. What does this imply for basic income? And here I would be very much interested in your ideas and, and thoughts later in the discussion. Um, to me, it seems plausible um, to argue um, for a heterogeneity of practices in response to basic income and for um, um, the fact that decoupling of practices from paid work will be relational to multiple factors. What matters for decoupling is how basic income would be justified. As can be seen by comparing communists, rentiers, and pensioners, democratically legitimated universal policies appear to be better placed to enable real freedom than private or community arrangements. It is essential, however, which kind of symbolic meaning will be attributed to basic income. For people to turn away from a life closely geared towards paid work, people's embodied beliefs 
about their worth and their labor need to change. Hence, a habitus transformation is needed, which in turn can only happen if the exterior social conditions change. And here um, I am at the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic, Hannah, thank you. Um, okay, I want to say thank you to all of our speakers and let's kick off the discussion. Just to let everybody know, we probably will run five minutes over. I think that'll be fine. Um, Martha, um, or Marta, you had your hand raised. Do you have a question for our speakers? Perhaps it was a Zoom slip up, or are you not finding yeah. it? Oh, no, there you are. Yes, hello. I only want to say that it was a very, very great um, presentation. <laughs> I want to say that's the only thing I want to say, you know. Oh, fantastic. It was very, it was very great. Yeah. I'm all here for the positivity and to kick off the discussion. Yeah. Um, I wonder, do any of our speakers have questions for each other while I travel through the chat and see what we, what people are saying there? Or, yeah, Hannah? Yeah, I I'd like to say something on Joanna's presentation, mm -hmm. which um, I found very inspiring. Um, and I I like yeah your your starting point of thinking around um, for, um, a good life from the point of view of, of the employee's life, right? But um, but sometimes I was wondering um, um, if you were talking about paid work because you always said uh, work um, without 